There are a lot of great sayings about how the best laid plans can all fall apart. I can't remember any of them right now. Maybe it's because my French bulldog Bruno is snoring down there, or maybe it's because I'm still recovering from what happened when I tried to sit down with John Hitchcock and Matt B. Lloyd to talk about Will Eisner. John Hitchcock was lucky enough to know Will Eisner and host him at conventions and be a part of his career for many years. He has some great stories, and I'm going to provide sections of our interview each day this week as part of Will Eisner Week and sharing the memory of Will Eisner. This is the last time you'll see any video from me during this episode, but I was able to grab a few screenshots of Matt, John, and even with myself in there just a little bit as we talked about Will Eisner and John regaled us with great stories and a lot of laughter. This is the first, there will be many. Thanks for joining. Yeah, man. Okay. So <laughs> first thing, uh, John, thanks for taking the time. Man. I really appreciate it. Yes, uh, it's no problem. Anytime I can do anything to help, I don't know, share history, save history and celebrate comics is something that, uh, Will Eisner would be proud of. All right. I, I can <laughs> I can definitely see his spirit uh, responding to that positively, both the character and the man. Uh, <laughs> well, he's one of the nicest guys that ever lived, so. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think uh, just to give folks a, a little bit of you know, yeah. history to sort of to set it up, um, you know, tell us about First, what was your history with comics before you first had the chance to meet Will Eisner? And then what well, was it like uh, first time and every time? Okay, well, you might have to sit down and shut up for a while because when <laughs> I get going, I don't stop. Um, so I got a big old thing of coffee. There you go. You're ready. You're ready. I'll be fine, well, man. I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. The, well, the, the first exposure to his work was um, – the Great Comic Book Heroes by Jules Pfeiffer, you know, had a big color set, hardcover, had a color section, and they actually reprinted a complete spirit story. And it was one in Egypt and uh, or Baghdad or something. But uh, it, it, it got everybody's attention because it was so vastly, I don't know, superior, more sophisticated than the other Golden Age work at that time. Uh, I mean, they had a lot of cool stuff, and they had Batman, they had Human Torch, they had Captain America. They had a bunch of cool stuff, but the Eisner thing stuck out. But then, I've, I've said this many times before, but see, I was very fortunate because there was a there were a couple of guys that were older than me by three or four years who looked at comic books as art and not just the X-Men slugging, you know, uh, Magneto. It was like comics, were, they, they drew, and I drew a little bit. And uh, and so one of the guys around the corner, his name was uh, Billy Cummings, and he was kind of like a mentor. And he found a spirit with the Harvey Spirits, but it didn't have a cover on it. And Scuttlebutt was that this spirit volume, I don't know if you ever saw those Harvey Spirits, but they're all Eisner. You know, there are Eisner spirit sections. And uh, rumor had it that somebody else drew them. Because there's no way one guy could be that good. And so we were going through them going, yeah, yeah, Stranko did this one. Or, yeah, 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 I think this was Neil Adams. Or, yeah, this, this, you know, we were trying to figure it out. And then later, after a, a span of a couple of months of arguing on who did what, it came to us that Eisner did it. And these, uh, he was the influence that these guys were looking at to, you know, to think of in terms of storytelling, you know. So that that kind of was a holy grail thing. And um, and then, of course, when they started reprinting the, the Warren Spirits, it was like heaven because they actually did interviews with, with Eisner, new covers, but interviews with Eisner talking about his stuff. And, and I was all in. I mean, I was like, I got to get this stuff. And I started really getting into it. Now, interesting sidebar, um, there was a guy I knew um, 
whose name was Tom Wimbish, and he actually went to Atlanta and he got Will Eisner to sign a Spirit magazine. And I asked permission, could I touch the signature? <laughs> because it was like it was like a holy grail thing. That's how much everybody admired this guy. Because they knew that he was like he was like the guy. He was like the man. And um anyway, so we've already talked a little bit about that last time, right? Yeah. But yeah, well, yeah. real quick, um we started we started throwing comic conventions in Greensboro in eighty three. And the reason why we did that is I was corresponding at that time with Alex Toth. And Alex asked if there was a local convention he could go to. And uh, and I said, well, there's one in Charlotte. So I went down to the, com- the Acme Comics downtown, which was our local store then. And I told John Butts and Tom Wimbish, who ran the store, and I worked there. I said, look, Toth wants to come to a show. Well, anyway, uh, they were like, well, and I said, should I send him to Charlotte? And they go, no, we can throw a show. What's the big deal? We'll throw a show. And I was like, okay. So I called up Alex, and Alex goes, okay, I'll come. And then something happened along the way, and Alex could could make it. Well, I'd already contacted, you know, when you have Alex Toth come to the show, you say, who would you like to be with him? Well, Archie Goodwin comes to mind, because Archie wrote some of the best stuff he ever did for Warren. And so we contacted him. And, uh, and Murphy Anderson uh, at the time, grew up in Greensboro. His dad owned the the, the local uh, cab company, and uh, and Murphy was coming. So I had these two guys coming to a show without a guest of honor. So anyway, um, I contacted these guys, and they all said, "If you're having a show, we're coming." So I was like, "Well, damn!" So we had the show. We were real arrogant. This is 1983. Very arrogant. We had a two-day show. Total disaster. We lost about $500. <laughs> couldn't fill up the room. Couldn't uh, couldn't couldn't even sell all the dealer tables. And uh, so when the show was over, um, this is the only convention I ever went to that they actually got a spare room and they turned it into a bar. <laughs> and Wimbish and and and, uh, and Butts were drinking. I don't drink, but they were they were trying to find courage or whatever to tell the guy. <laughs> Mark Austin, who owns Acme Comics at the time, I still owns it. But he he was like, we got to tell him. Guess what? We lost money. <laughs> so we're we're down at, we're down at the store and we look at each other and we're like, man, it was really a lot of fun, man. We got to meet Archie Goodwin. He's cool, you know. All these guys are great. And we had Bo and Scott Hampton there, and you know they were just starting out. And and uh, so Murphy comes into the store and he goes, well, who do you want for your next show? Now, you could see chiseled on their face. <laughs> Next show, you got to be shitting me. I mean, we just lost money. And, and and he was like, well, if there's one guy you'd like to have, who would it be? And, I mean, it was so funny, Seth uh, and, uh, and Mr. Mr. Lloyd. We all three looked at each other, and at the same time, we went, Will Eisner, which is kind of like, you think God would show up in Greensboro? I mean, that's the way we felt. And he went, well, I used to work with uh, on PS Magazine with Will, and he really likes doing shows, and I'm sure he'd love to come. We looked at each other and said, are you kidding me? We're going to have Will Eisner, second show. We're going to get Will Eisner. We're going to get the man. I couldn't believe it. And you know what? Murphy gave me his phone number. It took me, it took me about two or three weeks to get up enough guts to call him because I was scared to death. And he was very businesslike on the phone. You agreed to pay for what? The airfare, the room, the food. It's all on us. You know, it's a one-day thing. It's going to be great. And he agreed to come. And we all looked at each other. We could not. We, we totally <laughs> couldn't believe it. And Archie Goodwin came back. And uh, and the Hampton Brothers came back. And Murphy was there. And Julie Schwartz came. You know, Julie, uh, we had met up in Ash- Asheville at one of the the D.W. Howard shows up in, in, in Asheville. And, um, and we were like, this is, this is real. This is going to be cool. Well, um, uh, not to retread the stuff we already talked about, but Eisner came to the show and everybody was just, I mean, nobody would get in the car with him. I had to <laughs> drive, I had to drive him everywhere. And I had a, a, a 260 Datsun 260 Z with two seater <laughs> And Eisner was sitting in the passenger side, and uh, I knew it was going to be a lot of fun because Eisner, we pulled up beside of uh, the Hampton brothers who worked with him, you know, briefly on Contract with God, 
And they were all yelling at him because they were laughing because he was sitting so low. You could just see his, his head <laughs> bobbing up and down. And Eisner gave him the finger. He was like, you know, <laughs> fuck you guys. And I was like, this is my guy. And he's, he's, because the thing about Eisner is you began to figure out he had a great sense of humor. He liked to have fun. He, he couldn't take the whole worship shit. He couldn't take, he, he had a real hard time. I mean, the guys that were great, I mean, the guys that were genius guys, and Eisner was definitely one of them. They knew they could draw. They knew they could draw anything. I mean, they, they, they were confident in their skills. What they really wanted to know was, did they tell the story and you got the story? Because Will Eisner was about one thing, and that's being a storyteller. He was a storyteller. And that's where his most interest was, was being able to tell the story. And um, I told this story at... Um, the place was mobbed. We had over a thousand people, this little holiday inn. And, and so we're having, I, I told this story as Memorial in San Diego. And uh, I was the only person that stood up from the, from the crowd. And I just said, okay, here goes. I came from Greensboro, North Carolina. I'm going to tell you something. And uh, we had a dinner, a private dinner set up and everybody was there at the dinner. And I was sitting next to Eisner, right? And he's having, you know, steak and pasta or whatever the hell it was. And um, and everybody at the table kept elbowing me, go, John, ask him. You got to ask him. <laughs> ask him the question, John. You're the only one that can answer. Ask him the question. And so Eisner's listening to this, and I'm like, look, I can't ask him this. I can't ask him this question. And Eisner turns and looks at me and he goes, John, we're old friends now. Ask me, any, <laughs> ask me anything you want. And I looked at him, I said, okay, how do you stand being Will Eisner? I mean, how do you get up every day and look in the mirror and go, damn, I'm Will Eisner. I mean, how do you handle that? I mean, how do you deal with that? Because in my opinion, you're the greatest comic book artist in the world. You know, you did some of the most incredible stuff of all time. And the spirit's an iconic thing and everybody knows about it. I mean, how do you deal with that? You know, I mean, how do you deal with that? And the whole table fell out laughing. <laughs> and he looked at me and he went, well, John, I don't look at it that way. Uh, you know, I have to I have to get up and take out the garbage. My wife makes me take out the garbage. I don't look at it that way. It's very flattering that you would say that. But then he grabbed his fork and he pointed his fork at me and he goes, but don't get me wrong. I know I'm good. I'm damn good. <laughs> and the whole place fell out laughing. <laughs> Because he was, you know, and, and he knew what he was going to get with that. You know, he knew. But, you know, uh, to tell this story real quickly, I when he first got to the show, I took him to his room, and he was by himself. He wasn't traveling with his wife, Annie, then. And, uh, and I had gotten a fruit basket because I'd heard that in Atlanta he liked to eat fruit. Well, who doesn't like to eat fruit? But I was, so I went and got him a fruit basket. So I went, after I let him settle in, I went over and knocked on his door to get, the, it had the fruit basket. And he opened up the door and he goes, oh, John. I said, yeah, well, I heard that you really like fruit. I bought you a fruit basket. And he goes, well, come on in. Now, Will Eisner was wearing a pair of slacks and a t-shirt, a hoot t-shirt, just like the guys he drew in, in those stories in the 30s and 40s, you know, the old, you know. The wife beater. The, 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 you know, it's really, really cool. <laughs> And, and he goes, come on in, you know? And so I set the fruit down, and he grabs a, a peach, and, uh, and I grab a pear. And he said, let's talk about comics. And I'm uh, telling you, I'm telling you, buddy, we sat there for about an hour and just talked. And it was incredible, because he, Eisner was one of those guys that had very specific questions about things. You know, a little bit of this, a little of that, what about this, what about that, blah, 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 what, what, do, you, what do you like to read, blah, blah, blah. He was, he was great. And we really bonded and became friends <clears throat> sitting in there you know, swapping stories over a bowl of fruit. And, and we were, we remained friends the rest for the rest of his life. And, uh, he stayed at the Westgate in San Diego. I did too. We see each other every morning and, uh, the old timers, it was really cool because the old, the, all the, all the old timers were early risers. So if you, you know, and I, and so what I would do, and this happened, uh, in Atlanta, I'll tell this story. I was in Atlanta and all the other guys had crashed out and it was like seven 30. And I'm like, 
I'm going to go down and have breakfast. You know, I didn't, I'm not hungover. I'm afraid. So I, I run down there, and there's Eisner sitting in the Omni. If you remember the Omni. Yeah, I do. I which was a beautiful that. place. Yeah. Those great elevators that were always broken. But anyway. <laughs> That's true. I, and so I went, I, I, and there's Eisner, and he goes, John, come over and join me for breakfast, you know. So I go over and sit with him, and we're sitting there talking. And he said, John, would you do me a big favor? And I said, well, sure, anything, you know. Because I'd kind of gotten over the fact that I was, you know, talking to God. And I was like, yeah, what do you want? And he goes, I don't have any family with me. Would you be my family this weekend? Because I don't want to eat by myself. And I said, well, sure, anything you want. And he goes, well, you know, we could always have breakfast together and we could have lunch together. Because I just don't want to eat by myself. And I was like, be my honor. That'd be great. Sure, that's super, you know. And uh, so um, a couple of my friends finally did show up. And there I am sitting there with Eisner going, Hey, I'm sitting. Look who I'm sitting with. You dumbasses are sleeping. And I'm having a good time. And uh, and it was really funny because it was like uh, I guess this was on Saturday, and the show was going to end on Sunday. And so I'm sitting there, and uh, and um, uh, and I come walking over, and Archie Goodwin's there, and Archie and I were really good buddies. And Archie goes, uh, uh Archie goes, hey John, uh, um. We got a. You know, why don't Why don't you have a? Why don't you have breakfast with us? And we had a little crew. And he was gonna. He was great at like picking up checks. You know, he knew we didn't have any money. And uh, and you know, we spent every cent we had. You know, at the show. Just to get there. <laughs> well, to get there and maybe buy a couple of cool books and or a page of art or something. Well, anyway, right. um, and he said, "Is it okay?" He said, "He said, how about if a, how about you have breakfast on DC tomorrow?" And I was like, <laughs> and I was like. Well, that'd be great. Can I bring somebody with me? <laughs> and he went, okay, okay. And I went, here he is. And he went, well, 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 we'll ask her. Because there were two people that Archie Goodwin was intimidated. Will Eisner, Harvey Kurtzman. He couldn't take it. It was too much. They were idols. You know, he, he couldn't take it. Some people are like that. Me, I sound like I'm from Mayberry, and confidentially, I am from Mayberry. So people think I'm, I'm, I'm pain. I, I, there's no there, there's no problem with me. There's not going to be any problem with violence. With me. So I'm, you know, Andy would never hit anybody with a crowbar. Everything's cool. And he and, and I was going to go, I looked at Will, and I went, hey, Will, guess what? <laughs> We get we get free breakfast tomorrow. It's on DC. <laughs> Archie's gonna pick it up. And Eisner goes, We get free breakfast? And he goes, Man, I'm gonna have steaks and eggs for breakfast tomorrow because this is all on Leibovitz and Donafield. I always wanted to get some of their money. And he's and he's going, Yeah, I like that. And I went, I went, and I looked, I looked at everybody and I went, see, you bring up free food.